God bless you. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. Let's go before God in prayer. Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. I don't want to waste any time. Let's jump into this right away. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And when you get to Romans chapter 12, let's look at verses 1 and 2. And tonight we're going to continue our series on renewing the mind. But we're going to talk about, and I'm to this point now, of understanding the necessity of renewing the mind. And that's what we're going to deal with tonight. How necessary is it for us to renew our mind? Now, you know, I said to you before that the most important thing you can do as a human being is to be born again, to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. But as a born-again Christian, the most important thing you can do as a born-again Christian is to renew your mind. Renewing the mind is not a one-time event. It's a lifetime, it's a lifetime process. And when you renew your mind, you're exchanging your thoughts for God's thoughts, your ways for God's ways. You renew your mind, you're taking the way you think about something and you're lining it and putting it on top of God's Word. And if your way of thinking doesn't line up with that Word, then you allow that Word to change your way of thinking. You don't go and try to change the Word, you allow the Word to change your way of thinking. I am saying to you tonight that it is vital that we renew our mind. I, I, I'm not putting this out as if it is optional or something that if one day you decide you want to do, go ahead and do it. I am saying it is vital for you to renew your mind. And so in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And I said to you last week that this is a request for dedication, even down to your body. You know, you've heard people say, you know, I wasn't there last night, but I was with you in spirit. Well, God wants you to be there in body. So he's asking in, 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 in view of this grace and in view of this mercy, he's asking for dedication. But then look at verse 2. He says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And verse 3 says, uh, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now let's focus in on verse 2. And I, I want you to look at this. Look at verse 2 in the Amplified. And uh, there's, there's a lot going on here in verse 2. I mean, it'd do us good to spend all, all our time on it. He says, do not be conformed to this world. And then he has in parentheses this age. Now, you understand there's a difference between the world and the earth, okay? And, and I want to make that, that, that distinction tonight. He says, don't be conformed. When you're conformed, you are in harmony with something. When you conform, you, you are in compliance with something. And so he's asking, do not harmonize and do not comply with this world. He's not talking about with the earth. He's talking about with this world or with this age, with this age. Don't comply with this age. Don't comply with the things that are going on in this age. Don't harmonize with the things that are going on with this age. Don't harmonize with the, 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 the way of thinking in this age. Don't, don't harmonize uh, or comply with the way of doing things, the, a, a systematic way of doing things in this world. He says, don't harmonize or comply with that. He said, fashion after and adapt it to its external superficial customs. He says, but be ye transformed. Come on. But be transformed. Uh, be changed. So, I mean, if you want to change, the way to do it is to be transformed by renewing your mind, by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideas and by its new attitudes. So 
if you haven't renewed your mind, then you're still in conformity with the ways of the world. If you haven't renewed your mind, then you're still complying with the way of the world. And you can be a born-again Christian and still be in compliance with this age, with this, this, uh, this worldly way or this way, this, this systematic way of doing things, this age. Now, I want to I wanna, I wanna stop here. I want to look at the word world for a moment and spend a little time on this. The, the word world, it's, it's, again, it's not talking about earth, but sometimes, it, most of the time, it's talking about age, or it's a systematic, uh, hostile, it, it's a system, it's a system. The world's way of doing things is a system hostile to God, a system that is hostile to God. If it's not lining up with the Word of God, it's, it's going against God. And God is saying, don't comply with that. Look at James chapter 4 and 4. I, I believe he will explain it better here. This is something that got my attention uh, this morning when I was looking over this teaching. James chapter 4 and 4. He says, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world, the friendship of the world is enmity with God. So he says when you are, he calls compliance with the world, uh, he calls harmonizing with the world's thoughts and how they do things, he calls that friendship. And he says to comply and to harmonize with the world, with this age, is enmity with God. And he does not want you to be enmity with God. Now, it's important that you understand that change isn't change until you've changed. And you've got to understand how important it is not to comply and harmonize with the ways of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and 3 says something here. I want to read it to you out of the King James, and then I want to read it to you out of NIV. I want you to see if you'll pick this up. King James first and then the NIV, 2 Corinthians 10, 3. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, underline that, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So right here, he's talking about though we walk in the flesh, we don't, we don't war after the flesh. But look at the same scripture in the NIV. Notice what he says here in the NIV. He says, for though we live in the world. All right, so one translation says, though we walk in the flesh. The other one says, we live in the world. What is he saying here? When you comply and harmonize to the world, you are walking in the flesh. When you are comply and harmonize with the system that's hostile to God, he says, you are living in the flesh. A lot of times people don't really understand how to define worldliness. What does it mean to be worldly? What, how do you know when you're complying with the world and thus living in the flesh? Well, I'll show you. Look at 1 John chapter 2, 16. I want you to look at this in the King James Version, and then I want to look at it in the message. 1 John 2, verse 16. What does it mean uh, to be in the world? How would I even know that I am in the world and operating worldly? How, we use it all the time. We say, oh, that's worldly. Oh, that, that, that music worldly. Oh, that, that, that dress is worldly. How do you know if something's worldly? Well, the Verse 16 says, for all that is in the world, and he names it, all that's in the world, all that's in this age, all that is of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it is of the world. So when something's worldly or fleshy, it involves lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But I want to take it a little further than that because, I mean, you may be a new Christian. You're like, I still don't know what that means when something is worldly. Well, let me break it down to you a little bit more. Go to 1 John chapter 2, 16 in the message translation and watch this because he, 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 he amplifies it a little bit so we can see it. He said, don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out the love for the Father practically everything that goes on in the world, watch this, wanting your own way, that's the lust of the flesh, wanting everything for yourself, 
That's the lust of the eyes wanting to appear important. That's the pride of life. He says, has nothing to do with the Father. It has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from the Father. See, when you're, when you're worldly and you have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of, 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 of life, when you're wanting your own way, when you're wanting everything for yourself, when you're wanting to appear important, he says, all that does is isolate you from God. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. Amen. He says, uh, for yourself, wanting to appear important, it has nothing to do. Keep going. It has, it's, it, let's, let's start over again. Look at verse, go back, and I want to read it all the way through where we was. Don't love the world's way. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out the love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever uh, what the Father, who, who, whoever wants what the Father wants, God wants, is set for eternity. All right, so it's about what you want versus what the Father wants. So to be worldly is simply wanting your own way. Wanting your own way. That's fleshy and it's worldly. That is called the lust of the flesh. Wanting your own way. Wow, that's simplified, isn't it? Wanting your own way, the lust of the flesh, that's worldly. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, wanting everything for yourself, that's the lust of the eyes, that's worldly. That separates you from God, keeps you from God. It's worldly. It's fleshy. The pride of life, wanting to appear important, that's worldly. And it's, that's easy to do with the uh, appearance of social media, wanting to appear appear important. That's the pride of life. Pride of life, pride is always about this, this overestimation of yourself, this, this overimportance, this exaggerated importance of yourself. That's worldly. That's fleshy. So when you can see that you are pursuing wanting to appear to be important, that's worldly, that's lustful, that's enmity with God. When you see that you're you're wanting everything that you see. You're wanting everything for yourself. That's lustful. That's worldly. That's, a, that's, that's the lust of the eyes. It's, it's, an, it's enmity with God. That's, that's what it means to be worldly. So don't, 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 don't be so quick to call something worldly unless it has the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Unless it deals with wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, and trying to appear important. That's what it means to be worldly. That's what it means to be fleshy. If you understand that, praise God, hopefully. Amen. See, now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Well, let's finish this out. I, I think we need to just, I'm not, I, I, I came here tonight, I'm, I'm not rushing. Let's go to 1 John 5, 4 and 5. So how do we overcome the world? How do we overcome the world? How do we overcome uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life? How do we win when that happens? Because that's probably touched all of our lives at one time or another. I mean, that's, that's, that's probably something that's faced and challenged all of us one time or another. But how do we, how do we defeat this? I want, I'm going to look at these verses 4 and 5. He says, uh, he says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Now, you know what that means. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Whatsoever is born of God will overcome wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, and wanting to appear important. Well, how does that happen? Well, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world. Now, watch very carefully because it's important that you know the victory that overcomes the world. He says, well, Brother Dollar, that's no problem. The rest of the Scripture says that our faith is. Not quite. That is totally the truth, but you got to read the next verse so you can get this in context. He says, whoso or who is, the, who is he that overcomes the world, 
but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So put those two verses of scriptures together, and here's how you overcome the world, your faith in Jesus Christ. Well, what are you saying? Well, I, I, I'm saying it's not just your faith that overcomes the world, but your faith in Jesus Christ is what overcomes the world. Your faith in Jesus Christ. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay? That, verse, that first verse 4 says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even your faith. But your faith in what? Your faith in Jesus Christ. Your faith in Jesus Christ. Your faith in the finished works of Jesus Christ. That's how you overcome the world. Because when you have faith in Jesus Christ and you have faith in what Jesus has done for you and you, and you, have, and you receive what Jesus has already done for you, then you're going to overcome the lust of the flesh. And you're not going to want your own way because you have faith in Jesus Christ. You're going to want his way. When you have faith in Jesus Christ, you're not, going, you're not going to be overcome by the lust of the eyes, wanting everything for yourself because now it's no longer about you, it's about him. When you have faith in Jesus Christ, it's no longer, you know, the pride of life defeating you. You will now defeat the pride of life, wanting to, not wanting to appear, appear important because you know who the one who's important in your life. So it's not just your faith, it's your faith in Jesus Christ. And then look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. This, this really... This really blessed me. I, I, I could have picked a time to share it with you a little later, but this is, this is really good. Verse, verse uh, 5, watch this. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. All right, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God. All right, so th what, what, what kind of mind should we have in us that's in Christ Jesus? Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now watch this. Here's what we're supposed to have. Verse 7 but made himself of no reputation. See, when you have this mind that's in Christ Jesus, when you have that mind, you're, you're not, you're, you, you, will, you will be of no reputation. You're not trying to, 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 to get a big reputation, protect your reputation. He says you will be of no reputation. And then he says, and he took upon himself the form of a servant. Second thing, you're going to want to be a servant. You're going to want to have a servant heart because that's the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus. What mind? The mind of a servant. The mind of someone that is of no reputation. And then he says, and he was made in the likeness of men, verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Let this mind be in you. What mind? A mind of humility. A mind of humility, a mind of servanthood, a mind of uh, being of no reputation. That's amazing. See, when, you're, when you are of no reputation, you don't have to worry about trying to do something to make it better. When you are of no reputation, uh, you're, you're not going to crumble when it seems like it's worse. You are of no reputation. And I tell you what, when you are delivered from people, God can use you to deliver people. That is so, so very important. And so let's move on. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 5. Let's look at it in the King James and then the Amplified. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 5. Let's look at it in the King James and then the Amplified Bible. I, I hope I didn't spend too much time on those scriptures, but it's just so much in there. Look what he says. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are not fleshy, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Uh, strongholds are fortified uh, thoughts in your mind. Next verse. He says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, what? Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, let's look at this in the Amplified. Let's look at this in the Amplified. All right, here's what it says. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of the flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and the destruction of strongholds. And that weapon is the Word of God. Amen? Go ahead. He says, Inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself against the true knowledge of God. So there's a true knowledge of God. If there's a true knowledge of God, there's a false knowledge of God. And we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. And so the important thing here is that we understand. Is there anything else? Go to it. He says, he says uh, 
being in readiness to punish every insubordinate of his disobedience when you own with your own submission and obedience as a church are fully secured and complete. So here's, here's the deal. You can use the Word of God to pull down every thought that goes against God. And, but you, 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 you don't fight thoughts with thoughts. You fight thoughts with, with, with words. And so when there's a negative thought or a thought that doesn't line up with God's Word, speak God's Word out and pull that thought down. In other words, you're supposed to be a good custodian of your thought life. You're careful about what you think about. Amen? Now look at this, Isaiah 55, 7 through 9. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the introduction. I mean, just to get into this is going to be amazing. Look at uh, Isaiah 55, 7 through 9. And he says this, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now look at verse 8. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Wow. Now pay attention to God saying, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Now here's the thing that just gets me. God's thoughts are, are higher than my thoughts. God's ways are higher than my ways. So how do I reconcile this? He's given us his word. He's given us his word, and in giving us his word, he's given us his thoughts. He's given us his word, and in giving us his word, he's given us his ways. Now, he didn't give us all of his thoughts in this book, and he didn't give us all of his ways in this book. But think about it. In this book, it gives us thoughts that are higher than the thoughts we had before we knew the book. In this thought, he gives us ways that are higher than ways that we had before we knew this book. How in the world do we think that our college education, whatever, can be greater than God? And he's given us the opportunity to taste some of his thoughts and to know some of his ways, and there are people that refuse to know the Word. There's so many things we don't know. There's so many thoughts we have never had. Think about it. God, know, God has thoughts that we have never had. And when we get in his Word, he wants to show us those thoughts. He wants to show us his ways, but we refuse to, re we refuse to renew our mind. For some reason, People get saved, they think that's it, and they refuse to know their mind, and they can renew their mind, and they continue to live life based on those worldly thoughts because they hadn't gotten to the Word to get God's thoughts. Now, I'm going to say something here. This is, this is pretty strong now. I'm going to say something here. The biggest change you may have to make is whom you spend your time with. When it comes to this life of renewing your mind, you can't change without renewing your mind. But in doing this, the biggest change that you are going to have to make is who you spend your time with. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 33 in the NIV. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 33 in the NIV. Let me say this one more time. The biggest change you may have to make in order to, to, to renew your mind and enter into this place where God wants you to be is who you spend your time with. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 in the NIV says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. For you not to understand that the people you hang around with can corrupt who you are, he says you're being misled. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Most people build a circle of friends who help them stay where they are in life without making any changes. Listen to that now a circle of friends who help you stay where you are in life without any changes. They endorse each other's complacency. In other words, I'm just fine like I am with no plans of trying to make progress and go forward. And some people are surrounded by people that will support their complacency. Just stay like you are. 
If one person tries to break out of a rut, the other pressures them not to move so that uh, they won't be left behind. There is a kind of group pressure that stops growth. The question tonight is, who, who are you hanging around? And maybe they're keeping you the same. You're wanting to change and renew your mind, but you become satisfied in your complacency. But to renew the mind and to go on in life, you must leave friends like these and develop some new relationships. I'm not saying that's an easy thing to do, but you have got to judge yourself and ask yourself, am I still the same as I was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago? And could it be that I'm surrounded by people that are a big part of me not changing and not renewing my mind and not changing the way I think? Oh, Brother Doll, you're just going too far with this. There's no scripture that talks about that. Sure, look at Proverbs 13 and 20. In fact, this scripture is so important, I want to look at it in three versions. First, the King James Version, then the NLT, and then the Message. Proverbs 13 and 20. Let's look at it in the King James first. He says, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Well, that's pretty plain. Walk with wise people, you'll be wise. Walk with fools, you'll be destroyed. Look at this in the, in the uh, NLT. <clears throat> he says, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Look at this in the message. <clears throat> he says this, become wise by walking with the wise. Hang out with fools and watch your life uh, fall to pieces. Hang out with fools and watch your life fall to people, pieces. Where, where's your life right now? I mean, you look at your life and it should be so farther down the road than it is right now. And it's like you're like stuck in time. Nothing's really changed. Nothing, you know, it's, you're just kind of, you know, got those little four corners that you walk in and you never ever stop to think that just maybe it might be the company that you're keeping. And you're not changing and renewing your mind to grow forward because your mind is being set and nourished by those you're hanging with. Look at Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 1. Let's look at this in two versions, King James and then the NLT. Proverbs 12 and 1. You see, you got to love the process of change. You got to want to change and love the process to change. Somebody says, oh, I need to change. But change isn't change until you change. Somebody says, I want to change. But change isn't change until you've changed. Verse 1, whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. Wow. Wow. So somehow, you know, has anybody come in your life to try to correct you? Have, has anybody come in your life to try to give you some instruction and some knowledge and you just like, you don't know what you're talking about. It ain't none of your business. Leave me alone. I'm going to do me and you go do you. All right. Well, look at this in the NLT. This is pretty strong. He says, to learn you must love discipline. It's stupid to hate correction. It's stupid to hate correction. And, and it's sad to say, but we're living in a generation and a time where there are a lot of stupid people because they don't like correction. They don't want anybody correction. They don't want to listen to anybody. You know what happens? They know that somebody is going to bring correction, so they, they stay clear of those people. If you'll just kind of learn the power that comes with, cor with correction and love the process of change, your life can go to another level. You know, the world exalts the rebellious and the independent person. And while there are positive aspects to being unique and, and nonconformist, there are some things that happen when you take it a little bit too far. I mean, 1 Samuel chapter 15 and 23, you know, it, it, it talks about rebellion. Do, are you a rebel? Are you just rebelling against things that would, are designed to help you? He says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness. And are you stubborn? Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, or you've placed value in other things other than God. Because I've rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. 
Now listen to this carefully. So when we resist change, are you resisting change? When we resist change and when we resist, we resist growth, so when you resist change, uh, you resist growth. And the Bible says be changed by the renewing of your mind. So when you refuse to renew your mind, you're resisting change and you're resisting growth. What happens is we actually open ourselves up to evil spirits and bring all kinds of negativity into our lives. Christians who refuse to flow with the Spirit of God and they, they settle into a religious rut, they become some of the most rebellious, bigoted, stubborn people ever. And I mean the greatest hate and prejudice often comes from religious people who don't want to change. Religious people who don't want to renew their minds. And so this is a vital, vital piece, and my time is all gone. Man, that went by quick. Uh, I'll put a pin in that, and next Wednesday we'll pick up with, you know, the growth and the change in our lifestyle and how important it is for you to love it. You got to love change. You've got to love the change. You've got to love the growth. And you got to be in a position where you say, God, help me. Help me to renew my mind. I know you can't renew my mind for me, but help me to uh, have a desire to do that. You know, the Bible says God will give you the desire to do what pleases him. And so the prayer should be, God, help me to, to, to desire, to want to change my mind and to grow in you and to not be complacent with no plan to grow forward and to do better. Father, we thank you for this word tonight. I pray that the Holy Spirit did a much better job than I could have ever done and that the Holy Spirit will minister to people that take this word and enlighten them and, and show them things and guide them. And I just, I depend on you, Holy Spirit. You know, my job is to plant seeds and to water the ground, but you give the increase. And I pray tonight that you will give the increase, that we will know how necessary it is for us to renew our minds. I give you praise for this tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said amen. I don't know, maybe you're here. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never, you've never made Jesus your Lord and personal Savior. I want to pray a prayer with you tonight. Repeat after me, Heavenly Father, I realize that I'm a sinner, but right now I repent of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins, shed his blood, and that tonight I'm redeemed because of Jesus. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Save me. Be my Savior. And so right now, by faith, I declare that I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, um, if you could text the words, I'm saved, that's one word to 51555. If you'll provide your name and your email address, then we'll send you a free ebook as a gift to you today. And welcome, welcome to the kingdom of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's complete our worship through our giving. I believe that you're really getting a hold of this, that we don't give to try to get God to do something. We're not giving so we can get blessed. He already blessed us. We're, our giving tonight is an expression of our love and our appreciation and our gratitude for what he has already done. It is a part of our worship. In fact, it, it completes our worship. So many people, they don't understand the how vital it is to, to understand that giving completes your worship. We come to God and we say, Lord, because of what you already done, I, 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 bring, I bring this gift and I use this gift to worship you for what you've already done. And reach out with your faith and take hold of what Jesus has already made happen. So tonight, if you're giving through text, you can text world changers, space, and the amount to 74483. If you want to call the number and get some assistance there, you can call 1-866-477-7683. You can also mail to 2500 Burdett Road, College Park, or you can go on your web 
worldchanges.org or creflodollarministries.org and use your PayPal and other methods right there. I know you've, you've heard this and you've seen this on the screen for almost over a year, but you know, it's, it's a part of our worship. And I, you know, since I got that revelation, it's, it's, it's just easy for me to, to know that, you know, giving's a part of my worship. And when I give to God, it's just the greatest way for me to just be grateful and thankful. I mean, if God has ever done anything for you and you just didn't, didn't have enough vocabulary to thank him for what he did, that's what makes it so easy for me to be a giver because he is so, he is so easy. He's awesome. He's the father. Develop a relationship with him. Want him. Lean on him. Expect from him. Trust him. He's awesome. He's awesome. Praise God. Hey, uh, Wednesday night Bible crew, thank you for, again for joining me tonight for another Bible study. Um, take the notes, take the scriptures, review them over and over again. Again, get it in your spirit and allow God to come in and make a mark in your life that cannot be erased. Love you guys so much. I'll see you tomorrow morning for our confession time. And um, Man, it's just good. It's just good, good, good to have an understanding of God's Word and God's way. Have an amazing evening. Be good to one another. Stay safe. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Now unto him who is able uh, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to keep you faultless and to present you faultless before the almighty God. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. And everybody said, amen. Good night, everybody.